Okay, uh, so this is 10 web performance lessons for the 21st century. Uh, the title of this talk is loosely inspired by Yuval Harari's latest book. Uh, but before we talk about web performance, uh, let's recollect. Uh, because web, 10 years ago, uh, used to be a beautiful place. Uh, it was like, go to a website and do your thing. And that was everything. And for some reason, uh, it's not the same anymore. So you go to a website, but then this beautiful dance between you, the website, and the browser begins. And it starts with a location request. And you're like, go away, stalker. I don't even know you. Block. Oh, don't call me. I'll call you when I feel lonely. Block. Oh, I guess we need this involuntary consent here. So thank you, lawyers. Like, good job. And no, don't want your 100 max native app from a walled garden. I want nice, linkable web. And please stop those philosopher wannabe inspirational quotes and let's go straight to the content. And no, your app shell and the skeleton screen are not the content either. And of course, I'm more than happy to skip your newsletter and I hope I clicked hard enough this time. And then you can do your thing. Unless you can't. Oh, you noticed I'm using an ad blocker. Well, I noticed you're using 20 different tracking services. But okay. I'll turn it off for now for slightly better browsing experience, which is just a marketing term for bloat. By the way, modern web, you are quite heavy. I really wish I didn't have to download like one volume of Russian literature classics every time I pay you a visit. And I know it was easier for Leo because they didn't have JavaScript back then, right? It was like a long time ago. I wasn't even born yet. They probably only spoke Russian and C++ back then, I can imagine. But you know what, my dear web? Sometimes, sometimes you're even bigger than Doom. And I remember it was distributed on those two massive 3D printed save icons that we used to call floppy disks back then. And you may say, mate, it's okay. The metrics are showing we're fine. We're fine for the majority of our users. And yes, maybe we only care about those people on the left-hand side. Maybe we build it only for the wealthy Western web, not the worldwide web. But here's the thing. If it's a travel website and I'm trying to book a ticket to some remote island from, uh, from my office, I am on the left-hand side. But when I need to reschedule my flight back home from this remote island on a crappy local internet, from a crappy travel phone that resembles Tamagotchi, I'm on the right-hand side and I'm the same person. But then you may say, well, we have so few users in the long tail anyway. Well, maybe those people don't show up in your metrics because they're never coming back. So after I vented my initial frustration, I'd like to share my 10 biggest lessons about web performance. And those are the things that I stumble upon most often nowadays. Uh, my name is Mateusz and I've been a programmer since 2007. But I've been involved in web performance optimization only since 2013. And you may say, hey mate, it's only like six years since you got interested in this area of engineering. But if you consider that WPO, Web Performance Optimization, was coined in 2004, it means I've been involved for one third of its existence. So I don't know, it's like practicing medicine for 800 years, right? And of course, I'd like to think of myself like this master Yoda of web performance, but compared to those lovely people who I stole my ideas from, well, maybe I'm just a humble Padawan. Anyway, lesson number one. Uh, you are hired as a contractor to speed up a website. And on your first day, you test the website, and it's like super, super slow. And you're like, oh my god, I've never seen anything this slow in my life. And then you text your hiring manager, and you say, this job sucks. And he's like, yeah, I know. That's why we gave it to you. <laughs> because all developers who build it, they left for the greener pastures. But since you, you're a well-paid consultant, you have some tricks in your back pocket, right? You have some tricks. Well, you duck that go for web performance top 10 or top 20 optimizations. And then you apply like all of them, literally all of them. And six months later, we're back in the game, right? Sadly, all users are gone by now. And that's my first big mistake when I started doing web performance optimization. I was applying those random optimizations without knowing where the bottleneck is. 
And if there is one thing, one thing we can learn from the theory of constraints is that you never have a bigger problem in your current system than your current bottleneck. So start optimizing there. And that's my first lesson. Measure first, optimize your bottleneck second. Okay, measure first, but what metrics should I use? And what people measure in this space has changed over time. So back in the Stone Age, we only had like DOM content loaded and load time, because th those were the only things available. And nowadays, this data is also available in the performance timing API, which is like super, super useful, because now you can run it as a script in your users' browsers without going and asking them, hey, sir, hey, madam, can you open this network tab for me, please, and report the numbers back? That wouldn't scale. So in other words, collecting those two metrics is available in a lab setting, but also in real user monitoring. And some companies manage to correlate those performance metrics with their business metrics. So for example, Etsy found that every second they add to DOM content loaded, the conversion rate goes down. And while those two metrics sometimes may nicely correlate with your business metrics, they are actually not very good at describing the actual user perception of your website loading. So here's Gmail, just after DOM content loaded. Empty screen, not very useful. Seven seconds before the load happens, I can actually start reading a list of emails. And none of those two metrics captures this moment in time. So unless your website is mostly HTML and images, those are not the best UX metrics. They were awesome for Yahoo some time ago. So if you have something like this in production nowadays, you will be golden. For the rest of us, we need some better UX metrics. And that's how Speed Index and Custom Metrics got born. So just to remind you what Speed Index is, it measures how quickly the visible parts of your page become visible and render over time. But it requires capturing those video frames every X milliseconds. So unfortunately, it's only available in a lab setting. Okay, and then you can plot how visually complete my page was over time, and if you calculate the area above the graph, you get the number. And the lower the number, the better. But it has two problems. The first problem is that if you have carousels on your website, then carousels skew the result. But I would argue that if you have carousels, then carousels are your problem, not web performance. But more important than this, Speed Index values all your content the same. And since we know that not all pixels are created equal, and no one knows your business better than you do, well, you better come up with a custom metric. And the world's most famous custom metric is time to first tweet. So you can mark those important milestones while they are happening. And since this is a browser API, it's not only a lab metric, but something you can use for real user monitoring. And to be honest, this is probably the best real user monitoring metric you can get as of 2019. But surprisingly, only 14% of the websites use it. And here's why. Because it requires effort. So imagine you want to capture this hero image render time on your website. So you add this performance.mark in your image on load, and you start collecting data. And the bad news is, this data will be broken. Because to properly capture hero image render, and not just load, you need to learn some browser intricacies. So for example, if this image is loaded very, very early, but then some JavaScript starts running, well, you need to add another performance.mark in the script tag, and whichever performance.mark happens second, wins. So here's another question. Wouldn't it be nice to have like zero effort performance metrics that just work out of the box? Metrics that really answer those two questions. Can I see it? But also, can I use it? So if you are ever looking at your website and thinking, oh, look at this, first image or first text appeared on my website, this is what posh people call first content of paint. And if you are ever looking at your website and thinking, oh, look at this, a significant layout change happened, well, this is what posh people call first meaningful paint. And sooner or later, those things will be available in other browsers. Currently, it's only first content of paint that's available in Chrome. 
Uh, but we need to ask another question because all the metrics asked up to this point, they were telling us, can I see it? But with more and more JavaScript rampage on the main thread, we need to ask another question, can I actually use it? And here come two new metrics, first CPU idle and time to interactive. And they are very, very similar because basically they tell you when was the first five second window with no long task activity. And long task is anything longer than 50 milliseconds. And there is one additional constraint for time to interactive, no more than two network requests in this calm window. And not surprisingly, Lighthouse uses those four new metrics in addition to speed index as the main ingredients towards the CEO level performance score. And actually, the highest weight is given to time to interactive. And according to time to interactive, most modern websites are terribly, terribly slow. And I really wish the solution to that wasn't a native app prompt, because to me, it's a sign of giving up. And you may ask, are those interactivity, interactivity metrics available in real user monitoring? And theoretically, there's a long task API in the specs, but practically, we don't know how to measure those things correctly, because people interact with our pages in many different ways. So, no, it's a bummer. Anyway, here's my favorite workflow. So when I'm in development, I use Lighthouse metrics because someone has already put a lot of effort into curating those metrics. But when I release my code to production, I measure things like first paint, first content foot paint, until something better lands in the browser. And if you feel adventurous enough to write some custom code, well, you, you cannot go wrong with custom metrics. And also, please watch for more metrics coming up in this space, because the search is not over. Anyway, lesson number two, measure what matters. OK, so we have some potentially useful metrics. Now the question is, what values should we expect for those metrics? And how fast should we be? And I like how Monica Vinculescu said it on Twitter. She says, if you wouldn't make eye contact with a stranger for the time it takes your web app to first paint, it's too slow. So this is what slow looks like to me, right? This is slow. And there is also this rule saying, try to be 20% faster than your competitors. Because this is when people start noticing that you're fast. So yes, you can do some competitive analysis and find some areas where your neighbors are not doing tremendously well, and then you can set yourself your own performance budget. So you may want to say, I want my speed index to be 1,500, but you have to be very, very specific. For example, on a 3G, slow 3G network and on this iPhone 5S, because let's say those are representative for your users. And then you can enforce those numbers in continuous web performance testing, because modern software engineering is not intermittent, it's continuous. And then you can also visualize your performance budget and put it on the biggest monitor you can find in your office and get people excited about web performance. And sometimes, sometimes you have to be bold enough to declare so-called performance bankruptcy. This is when you are like way slower than all your competitors. And here's the thing, once you're beyond so-called performance poverty line, your performance improvements cease to matter to your business metrics. So for example, you may be very proud of yourself that you cut from like 20 seconds first paint to 16 seconds, but your users, they may not even notice. Okay, so in this search for better performance budgets, let's visit Alex Russell's blog. Alex works for Google, and he gives very specific budgeting advice for mobile targeted websites. And he tells us, your time to interactive should be under five seconds. Okay, and in his calculations, he assumes a median worldwide user with slow 3G network and a cheap 200 bucks Android device. And in order to be within this five seconds time to interactive, you cannot send more than 170K of critical path resources, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript after GZIP. And what I like about this way of framing things is that he translates something that's meaningful in production into something that's really meaningful in development, because it's super easy to measure the bundle size when we develop things. And in his calculations for those numbers, he takes into account several things. So for example, very slow DNS setup takes one third of your budget. Okay, then 
data transfer over slow 3G network takes another part of your budget. And if your website is JavaScript heavy, which is most JavaScript applications like single page applications, you have to adjust your budget to 130K because JavaScript processing time on the client device is very, very significant. And to be honest, I wasn't able to find why five seconds was chosen. And previously, people were telling us your website should load in one second. And nowadays, we know that it's not even possible under those realistic conditions. And if you try looking for the original source of those numbers, it usually goes back to the research of Jacob Nielsen. Okay? But there is this gentleman who followed the citation trail from Jacob Nielsen's work to the, pre to the previous white papers, and he found that it's mostly smoke and mirrors. And there's no significant research to back it up. So those are mostly magic numbers. Anyway, lesson number three. Get yourself some performance budget, but do not obsess about some magic numbers from web performance advocates. And speaking of advocates, in the last couple of years, I've observed this ongoing battle between web performance advocates and JavaScript framework funds. And one comes is like, use the platform. The other comes is like, no, use React. No, but performance matters. No, developer experience matters. No, user experience matters. And I'm like, relax, they, they all matter in different proportions for different apps. And people just disagree to what extent. And since JavaScript causes so much controversy in the interwebs, let's devote lesson number four to this subject. And here's a disclaimer. JavaScript startup time may not be an issue for your application, but if it is, please bear with me because JavaScript, median size of JavaScript on the biggest websites is growing. And actually, third-party JavaScript is growing significantly faster. And here's one experiment I run on, on Airbnb. So when I click on this calendar widget, I have to wait for over three seconds for the calendar widget to pop up because JavaScript in yellow is blocking my main thread activity. And some people tell me, hey, mate, just ship one less image, and then you can add your JavaScript framework instead. And while on the network, JavaScript and images may seem identical on the client device, JavaScript processing time is orders of magnitude more expensive than image processing, especially on the lower end devices. And there's often a huge gap between what developers had when they were developing software and what actual users have. So yeah, frameworks, they certainly solved some problems, but they also created some new problems that require those sophisticated inventions. So nowadays we're like code splitting and tree shaping and scope hosting, things that were mostly unheard of 10 years ago. And I'm not gonna cover any of those optimizations in this lesson. I will suggest a simpler one. One that leads to less invention over time, what, one that doesn't exclude those more advanced optimizations, but actually makes them optional by default. And this is to use lighter framework. And I mean really, really small one. Uh, I have to say that I rarely get excited about frameworks, uh, but I want to make a quick sales pitch for HyperApp, because this is actually the only one that I found that ticks most of my boxes when it comes to JavaScript frameworks. So HyperApp is basically like React and Redux the good parts in a nice standalone package without any boilerplate. So what you're getting is just a reactive view and state, and that's all I care about for starters. And here's the important part. It's only 400 lines of code, which means I can understand it in its entirety without being a core contributor, because I can read over the entire code base over the weekend. And the entire code base is actually smaller than many Webpack configs on typical web projects. And uh, due to the simplicity of the Elm architecture that it's inspired by, it has very, very few concepts to learn. So it really fits in my head because it's mostly programming with JavaScript, with the language construct, and not with the framework concept. Okay, so the code base is not polluted with framework extends or add component annotations or some other dendruff. Uh, and finally, finally, it matches my preferences of not using these and new and class and mostly sticks to the nice and simple functional parts of the language. But most important for us here, performance-wise, it's really, really fast by default. And there is this real world app project. Have you heard of this application, real world app? This is like a bigger version of Todo MVC that shows how to build the same medium clone called Conduit in many different frameworks. 
And I decided to build my own version in HyperApp. And the whole thing is 27K. And the application code is only 14K. And all my dependencies is 13K. And the web framework is just one kilobyte. And it also does pretty well in runtime metrics. But I encourage you to run on your own code and test it. And uh, we're going to move to something different now. Because there's this lovely book, uh, Food Rules by Michael Pollan. And if you are wondering what it has to do with web performance, let me tell you. Absolutely nothing. Uh, but it has this beautiful quote. Eat food. Not too much. Mostly plants. Which leads me to my next JavaScript dieting lesson, which is write JavaScript. Not too much, because this is the most expensive asset. Mostly functions. And I will explain it later. But here's the thing. Even if we can tame our JavaScript, sometimes we use those frameworks where simple HTML would suffice. So last year, people were talking about Netflix moving from client-side React to server-rendered HTML and 300 lines of vanilla JS, which resulted in 50% faster time to interactive and 200k less of JavaScript. And I'm looking at this and thinking, well, this is something that shouldn't be a single-page application in the first place. And while working with different companies, I noticed that most people nowadays, they reach for those single application frameworks just by default. And they usually create those front-end monoliths that prevent them from do doing any kind of evolutionary architecture. And the other day, I asked this uh, one gentleman who looked like this barbershop logo, why did you choose this framework? And he was like, I don't know. And I'm like, well, that's a good start. Uh, but then he added, oh, I guess it was popular. And I was like, bingo, because this is what posh people call the availability heuristic. So whatever is in the media occupies our minds. And it also applies to programmers. So we open Hacker News with suspense, and we're like, hmm, everyone is hooked on this latest and greatest version of my framework. And my team, we are stuck on this legacy framework from six months ago. We better keep up with the Joneses. Oh, shiny, shiny thing <laughs> to the right. But maybe the reality is that boring technology, technology just works. It's like another normal day, business as usual. Didn't spend my proverbial 10,000 hours configuring Webpack. And you may say, hey man, you are advocating for the boring and static web. And you'll be right, because I want a boring website where I can book a flight, and I'm getting Angular is not defined instead. I want a boring website where I can buy stuff and I'm getting cannot read debug of undefined. I want a boring website where control click predictably opens things in a new tab and doesn't reload my current one. And I want a boring website that doesn't suffer from the back button amnesia. So here I'm going to some article. I click back. Oh, and I have to scroll back again. Why? And yes, those things can be done in JavaScript. But for example, none of the real-world app projects that I mentioned before got it right, including mine, because it's not a default. So here's the thing. Maybe what works for those really, really big companies throwing armies of developers, rewriting most of the browser features in JavaScript, may not work for the others. That's me, trying a new framework, trying not to get hurt. And similarly, if you have 20 junior developers after a bootcamp, who are emulating processes and tools of those big companies with hundreds of senior developers. Sorry, but things may go wrong after this honeymoon period ends and you drift off the tutorial happy path. And same applies to performance, because it turns out that browsers can help you with HTML optimization just for free. So here's an example. You send this large HTML page to the browser and there is this built-in streaming HTML parser inside your browser, and it discovers CSS, and it can start the rendering of a website way before the full HTML response arrives. And you don't have to do anything. But when I'm fetching JSON in my single page application, then it's like buffering data by default, and I have to wait for the whole response, and only then I can render things. Because JSON is not a streaming-friendly format. And often people reach for things like new line delimited JSON, which is like a pseudo format, but then you have to write custom code or add a library to effectively implement what browsers give you for free when you just stick to HTML. But then you may say, 
But you know what? Your bloated HTML is bigger than my JSON. And my answer is nope. Because what you call bloat, gzip calls compressible. So HTML and JSON after gzip are effectively the same. But then you may say, haha, my framework can do server-side rendering nowadays. And yes, you may hear this advice to enhance client-side render with server-side render. So your HTML renders a little bit earlier and JavaScript synchronizes afterwards. And yes, you will get your first pane a little bit faster, but usually it will also degrade your time to interactive. And modern frameworks are promising. We're going to give you this progressive partial hydration, yada, yada, yada. But it's like a never-ending spiral of those complicated solutions to those problems that we created for ourselves. And I want to add some nuance here. I really, really like those well-executed single-page applications. If they are needed, and if you can afford them. But here's a startup idea for those of you willing to disrupt most of those form-heavy, table-heavy, text-heavy websites I'm seeing every day. Clone them. Do minimal JavaScript. Do fast server-side rendering, and then outcompete them on the next billion web users with cheap Android devices. And here's a quiz for you. There's roughly 7 billion people in the world today. Which map shows where they live? Since we don't have time, I'm going to answer. Many of your next customers will come from this area here, from Asia, because there's more human beings alive in the circle than anywhere else on the planet. But also, African market will grow tremendously. And go figure what kind of devices those people are going to use. And here's a corresponding lesson. Write code. Not too much, mostly HTML. We've got the technology. And sometimes respect for old is better than obsession with new. But here's another question. What if boring is not an option? If boring is not an option, then we invent stuff, right? So here's a quick story. You meet this nice little fellow, and you ask, hey, what's your name? And he's like, hey, I'm CSS. And you look at him, and you're like, no, you're JavaScript now. Because C in CSS obviously stands for JavaScript. And then the founding fathers of the web are looking at you, and they're like, what have you done? What did you do to poor CSS? Where is your HTML? Why is everything in JavaScript? Oh, because JavaScript gives me better developer experience. If you care about developer experience, why would you choose JavaScript? Oh, because it's popular. McDonald's is popular. Is it your favorite restaurant? Right? Uh, of course, I'm exaggerating to make a nicer story. JavaScript pays my bills. Uh, <laughs> but this is a nice segue to this topic, because there's been increasing interest in those compiled to JavaScript languages recently. And to be honest, I don't like the ones where most of the money goes to nowadays. Uh, I want to focus on languages that I personally find compelling, especially for the long term, not the next year or two, for the next 10 or 20 years. And this is statically typed functional programming languages. And I will use Elm as my example, not because it's perfect, I'm fully aware of its limitations, but it's really, really well polished and has really nice performance characteristics. So Elm basically has like no frameworks, because language itself replaces a collection of libraries from the JavaScript world. We have this combinatorial explosion of dirty corners and duct tape, and things just mostly work nicely together. And surprisingly, the production build of Elm for the real-world app project I mentioned before is only 29k. And this is despite of all the capabilities that the language gives you. And just to put things into perspective, this is the same size as my tiny HyperApp version. To give you another perspective, React Core Library itself, just the library, is 32K. So no matter how much code splitting you do, you will never go below this number. And the reason for that in Elm is dead code elimination. But this is not like the JavaScript version that we know as tree shaking, that only works at the module level, but function level dead code elimination. So only the functions that you actually use are included in your bundle. And the cool thing is that it applies to your own code, to all your libraries, but also to the language itself. So the less Elm you use, the less of it is included. And there's no need for those weird 
deployments with like one function packages. There's no need for those weird plugins that are optimized for a single library because language design itself allows for a generic elegant solution to a problem. And now you may ask, hey, why can't we have it in JavaScript or one of its supersets like TypeScript? Because in JavaScript, functions can be removed or redefined at runtime, right? So, for example, you can tinker with array.prototype at runtime, and since Elm doesn't allow for this dynamic tinkering, it can enable those optimizations across your entire code base. But now you may say, I don't really care about load-time performance, I really care about runtime performance, which actually makes your web application more like a game. And with more and more JavaScript libraries getting their rendering faster, there's not really much difference once you do the optimizations. What really matters to me at this point is how easy it is to make those optimizations without a PhD in framework design, but also how safe those optimizations are. So since Elm is a pure functional programming language, not some weird mix of paradigms, all functions are pure and all data structures are immutable. And purity plus immutability make for some super, super easy optimizations. So for example, in Elm, there's no stateful components. There's only view fragments that describe parts of your view. And you just pass part of your state, and you get some virtual DOM. So if you want to optimize pure function, you just add one keyword, lazy, and it's over. The optimization is done. And now Elm can and skip building those virtual DOM nodes as long as the input hasn't changed. Right? So basically what you are trading off is uh, you spend some more memory, but then you save some CPU cycles. So it's basically like a React pure component or a shoot component update, but there's one huge difference. This one is guaranteed to have no side effects. And I know that you never do stupid things in your pure components, but I do. And L is stupid people friendly. And I'm stupid people. I actually grew up suspicious of my own code so much that when I write a new line of code in Java, I no longer trust the line before. Or imagine this coworker of yours who always refuses a code review every time you approach his desk. I wouldn't trust them either. And since all data structures in Elm are immutable, if you need to compare the input like a list of items, you don't need to do like deep equality. You can just use triple equals in a transpiled code. So it's really, really fast. So yeah, effectively just one keyword and your virtual DOM gets optimized. And now you can invoice your customer for this one little word. And if they complain, and they probably will, you just say, it ain't much, but it's honest work. <laughs> so what I want you to remember from this section is the following question. What capabilities are enabled by my language constraints? Okay? Am I willing to go further away from JavaScript to achieve things that will never be possible if I just stick to JavaScript or TypeScript, where most of the good things are only possible by discipline and not by default? And there was this experiment from 1999, and they asked participants, hey, here's a barrel of clean water. Would you drink from it? And most people, most people are like, yeah, of course, it's a barrel of clean water. Okay. What if we add a one drop of urine? What about now? So it's no longer just some water with a drop of urine. It's contaminated water now, right? So it takes one innocent drop of impurity to ruin the everywhere as experience. So one type unsafe function, one impure function, and you ruin everything. So maybe switching between different JavaScript frameworks or adding some gradual typing live boy is just emperor's new clothes. Maybe we need a quantum leap to a much safer world. And here's our lesson number six. Previously we said you may not need JavaScript, but sometimes you may need more than JavaScript. And for me personally, those breakthrough moments in programming came from studying languages like Elm or Haskell, and not from trying to copy slightly better version of Java or C Sharp to JavaScript. And if we are looking into the uh, future, not just the next year or two, but for the long term, for the WebAssembly age, this is where I want to put my bet on for the WebAssembly age. And I don't really care which language it is, as long as it has those nice enabling constraints that I'm personally looking for. 
And here's the thing, the more you're going to spa, the more you need to understand your browser. In particular, you need to understand how to translate this rendering pipeline into browser activity. So imagine you have this, this Reddit, uh, Reddit clone, and it has like hundreds of comments, and you can vote up and vote down, and you click on one of those buttons, and it gets frozen. Okay? And now you can start throwing those random optimizations at the problem, hoping that something will eventually click. But you'd be better off running some performance analysis. And it may get overwhelming. I don't know how many people can read this kind of graph. OK. So what this screen says is that JavaScript has gone insane. Okay? And your machine will very soon turn into a barbecue grill because they call it a flame chart for a reason. And if you go to the summary tab at the bottom, you will find that JavaScript is to blame. And the rendering and painting are rarely your biggest problem unless you're doing some CSS art. But then you go to this uh, upper top and you see, oh, there's this red triangle. This is where the problem is. So you zoom in on one of the, of the longest bars and you see, oh, it's a render function. It's a render function that takes most of the time. But this is a framework code, so you keep looking for your own code, and then you find, oh, this is a comment and comment view functions. So now I can form a hypothesis. Because I'm, I'm implementing this thing with a functional architecture, and state and view are nicely separated, and I see that view function is the longest bar, I know that state updates are not the problem. So I have to reach for one of the view optimization strategies. So I can use this windowing technique and only render a subset of nodes, which is pretty cool, but it breaks this Control F or Command F search in your browser, and you have to implement custom search. No option for me now. Uh, you can add keys to your lists, right? So you can add, uh, for example, in React, you can add this key thing, but it only applies when you remove or add new nodes to a list, and this is not my problem. And finally, you can skip work. And this is the optimization we've seen before in the previous lesson. So you apply this optimization, boom, JavaScript activity is gone. So when I vote for one of the buttons, the other 100 are not even re-rendered. Okay? So yeah, we just put down the fire. Sorry, JavaScript, the grill party is over. And lesson number seven, observe the not-so-secret life of your browser. Okay, so we already covered seven lessons, and we are already running out of time. So let's just jump straight to my all-time favorite optimization trick. And here it is. You ask yourself this question. What do I need my website to do? Well, I need to download and render most important elements of the page. And that's it. You have to resist the temptation to add all the other crap. And I can apply the same performance advice to my talk. Because what I need my presentation to do? Well, I can cover the most important elements of the talk. And then I can stop. So yes, we could be talking about some cool font optimization strategies, well, but maybe you can just drop web fonts and your website still looks amazing. Or we could be talking about how to make parallax fast, how to remove junk, how to move things to a separate layer, but maybe we can apply the Mari Kondo test. And Mari asks you, what's this? And you say, this is parallax scrolling. Does it spark joy? Absolutely not. So beat the crap out of it, put it on fire, and burn it into pieces. Sorry, I got carried away. Actually, Mari is a really, really nice person. She, she would just say, thank it, and let it go. And I think it's important to adopt this more general mindset in life and ask yourself this question. What happens if I drop a certain feature, process, ritual, tool? What happens? And it turns out that sometimes nothing happens. So maybe we aren't going to need it. Okay, and once you remove bloat from the web, your articles become instant without Facebook, Facebook instant articles, and your mobile pages, they become accelerated without accelerated mobile pages from Google. So maybe you don't need this help from Silicon Valley giants trying to hold your hands and trying to help you if you just remove the bloat. So maybe for all this time, we've been asking ourselves the wrong question. Maybe it's not can I use, but should I use? And lesson number eight, have courage in your minimalism. OK, we started with me complaining about the state of the web. And now I should possibly leave you on this positive note with this heartwarming take-home message, right? So I should probably say, go make the web faster. 
and you'd come out of this room really motivated because you've just awakened this performance optimization giant within. But then you'd go back to your office, then you optimize your JavaScript, cut 100 milliseconds of load time, and then marketing casually drops this four megabyte image and they ruin everything. And you're like, ha, huh, I'm gonna set a performance budget for them. So you set a performance budget. And a week later, a designer drops by and he hands you over this mock-up. And it has like three massive parasols and this huge background image. And you're like, ha, we've got performance budget. And he's like, sorry, mate, it's been already approved by our CEO. Oh, what performance budget? Sorry, already approved. And you're like devastated. And those two examples are symptoms of a much bigger problem. And I like how Michael Feathers put it into words. He says, you always ship your organization, so design your organization well. Okay, so it turns out that, for example, some deployment problems, they cannot be solved in a separate dev and ops silo. And that's how DevOps movement got born before it got misinterpreted as admin who knows Docker. And similarly, you cannot solve certain web performance problems if design and marketing and development are operations are siloed in their little worlds. So here's the thing. If you hire good people into the organization that is set up for failure, you don't fix the organization. You break the people. So here's my, my advice. Go make faster organizations, and hopefully, faster web will follow. But that's actually a topic for a different talk, and also my shameless plug for my university classes for managers. Going back to web performance, uh, Harari's latest book tries to answer this question. What should we teach our children today to prepare them for the world of tomorrow? And here's my answers in the web performance world. Measure things that matter before you optimize your bottleneck. Get yourself some performance budget along the way so that you don't go crazy with spending. Write code. Not too much, mostly HTML, some JavaScript, but also embrace those nicer programming languages for the better future of our children. Because I don't want our children to maintain dad's or mom's JavaScript or TypeScript. And also, once you start doing more complex things, be prepared to peek inside your runtime, inside your browser. And finally, make faster organizations, and hopefully, faster web will follow. Oh, by the way, cut the crap. Have courage in your minimalism. Because sometimes, sometimes, nine is enough. I really hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation and your time here, because now you are 45 minutes closer to your death. Because time is actually more than money. Thank you.